can't say enough's enough We better start to pray That we'll see another day Well, they're using up the lights Watching all the fights And paving all that's green Well, this world is getting Most of the carbon that we mine from the crust of the earth is millions of years old. Coal is particularly interesting because per unit of energy generated, coal actually is maybe the cheapest fuel, but it also releases the most carbon to the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Beginning in earnest with the development of the steam engine in the late 17, early 1800s, humans began to mine and extract fossil carbon from the Earth's crust, coal, oil, natural gas. Even in the absence of humans over some time period, it would be uplifted and subjected to erosion and removal and uh, might return to the atmosphere. But those rates are tiny compared to the ability of humans to go out with large machines to deliver large quantities of this material to the surface of the earth where it is burned in, in the useful generation of energy. We have larger equipment that was introduced on surface mines about 25 years ago here in West Virginia, which accounted for the, uh, the ability to recover coal seams that heretofore had been unmineable. The use of drag lines allowed the mining of seams that were uneconomical to mine and even physically impossible to mine without the use of a drag line. Many people 25 years ago when the first company said they were going to bring a drag line in, they were laughed at and they said there's no way in the world you can, you can get a piece of equipment like that on the narrow ridges of uh, southern Appalachia. And, and they were determined through engineering abilities and persistence to make certain that it worked, and, and it has. Matthew 
need to shut down this silo. Matthew needs to come to work. We must start protecting these communities. Matthew is dismantling these communities. Once these mountains are gone, there is no more Appalachia. There is no more West Virginia. It don't grow back. It's not going to come back. I mean, you know, we had a, a politician get up on TV not long ago. He said, well, the reason the ginseng is being extinct because the deer are eating it all. Well, what about this thousand acre mountaintop removal site that's nothing but solid rock now? The process of mountaintop removal coal mining is an awesome display of coal extraction engineering. It is also quite simple. Once a site is identified, clear cutting begins. Next, explosives are used to blast away the earthen material covering the coal seams. Then, machinery, including massive shovels called drag lines, remove the overburden, which is then deposited in adjacent valleys called valley fills. Mountaintop removal coal mining can bring down the elevation of a peak by hundreds of feet. Sites are often thousands of acres in size. Whatever the dates are, like Action Prep in Blacksburg and Richmond yeah. or something. Yeah. In the spring of 2005, a group of activists, college students, and local citizen conservation groups joined together to oppose the widespread increase in mountaintop removal mines throughout southern Appalachia. The group called their campaign Mountain Justice Summer there was going to be kind of this renewal of coal mining in Tennessee and some of those mines were going to be you know mountaintop removal mines you know we were like hey this is you know now we're dealing with this issue too it's not just an issue in Kentucky and West Virginia like hey let's put something together and kind of up the level of opposition to this issue and let's help make this issue a national issue that everybody has to deal with See what they're doing, in some ways they're dividing our community. I've got nothing against free speech, but when you come in here demanding people's jobs and close their schools down and, and, and all that, you're lucky you don't get hurt, hurt bad. You can't take 25 people in that community and try to fight a coal company. But you take all these other big environmental groups that are right, you know, someday we got to make the change over. There's such a, a fine line there that, that you really, you, you can't step the wrong side of it. If you tell the mine company that they can't do something, then how dare you? If somebody's in California or North Carolina or New York City, they're connected to mountaintop removal because they're turning on the lights. Their opening strategy was to draw attention to a school situated close to a mountaintop removal site in Marsh Fork, West Virginia. The mine is owned by Massey Energy, America's fourth largest coal producer. Marsh Fork Elementary is a very, very scary situation. They have 2.8 billion gallons of coal slurry which is, it's toxic, it's toxic material. It has arsenic, lead, lime, mercury, chromium. There's a lot of really, really bad chemicals in this sludge. There is a, a lake of this, 2.8 billion gallons of coal slurry, sitting behind this elementary school, 400 yards up on top of a mountain. There's 228 kids in this school. The sophistication of engineering that goes into the construction of those is, I suspect, not duplicated in any other physical structure anywhere in, in the world. From, from talking to uh, people that have seen it, said what's in there is hard as your head, and he ain't going to run nowhere. You know, it dries up. Slug. Yeah. Where do you think it goes? I have no idea. In 1972 at Buffalo Creek, there was this disaster where one of these impoundments basically blew out. Millions of gallons of this nasty sludge and water went barreling down a small holler and killed 125 people. Destroyed like 4,000 houses, 1,000 cars, you know, hundreds of people were injured. Besides the danger of flooding, Wiley and other residents are concerned about the health effects 
posed to school children from the coal processing facility located directly behind Marsh Fork Elementary. It only sits 300 feet away. 350 feet away, it's been measured. It sits directly across that river. And you've got serious chemical problems over there. You've got the magnetite, you've got the flock, you've got the ammonia that they use. It's just bad, bad stuff. They use diesel fuel in there. They mix all this stuff together. You've got bad headaches all the time. You've got asthma problems occurring more and more down there. I mean, it's just about five or six, 10 or 15, a lot of kids. Uh, with the asthma, and a lot of them keep like a cold all the time, it's just draining all the time. The kids are coming home with blisters in their mouth, little tiny blisters the size of a pinhead, all in their mouth. But not everyone shares their concerns in this small community, where many residents work for the coal industry that surrounds them. If I wasn't comfortable and if I was scared, I would not let her go there, and she will be in first grade. She was in kindergarten last year, played on the playground three times a day, um, wore light collared clothes, and she, like I say, she never came home filthy, dirty with cold dirt or, you know, any sickness. And I have medical records to prove that she has, she's not had anything other than a common cold like any other, you know, child. There's a weedy. <laughs> <laughs> Frustrated with local school board and government officials' inaction on improving safety at Marsh Fork Elementary, Ed Wiley, whose granddaughter Kayla attends Marsh Fork Elementary, launches the Pennies of Promise campaign to raise $6 million to build a new school. And so what do you have here? What is that? A piggy. <laughs> What's inside there? Money. Is it your money? Now it's money to build a new school. And what makes you want to build a new school? Because I don't like having a coal mine right behind our school. Okay. And so you're a young girl, and you're going to the governor's office. You nervous? What are you going to ask him? Build us a new school. To start the Pennies of Promise campaign, Wiley and his granddaughter Kayla present the governor with over $400 in pennies he and others have collected. We'd like to see the governor. We have some money to present him. I have uh, some people here from the Marsh Fork area that have brought in uh, some pennies and they want to see someone in they want to see the governor or someone in the governor's office. The Marsh Fork School area. Give it to him. Okay. Uh, say Travis is in the meeting. Okay. Well, just uh, just go ahead and tell him then that the uh, pennies are here and they want to see the governor. Okay. Thanks. Bye bye. He's running about thirty minutes behind. We don't um, Okay. <laughs> Got all day. stacked up and kids everywhere. How are you all doing? Hi, Governor. Good to see you. Hi. We have a young lady here from Marsh Fork Elementary. Hey, like babe, how are you? Present you or something. Fifth. What's your name? Kayla. Kayla. How are you doing in school? Good grades? Study hard? Your happy school's out and summer's coming? <laughs> what are you going to do this summer? Swim. Oh, boy. Hi. <laughs> Good to see you here. How are you all doing? Hi. How are you? Hi. Okay. Kayla has a little gift here have, for you. Kayla? This is our campaign. Okay. Now we're, let me just, you know, because uh, I know we worked on this some, we talked about it before, we're talking about the school, right? Yes, sir. about the school. Where are we at with the local board of education? Let's start all over, sir. Let's back up a whole lot. We're not going to get them involved. You took a sworn or to protect the people in West to Virginia. Go to Wait a minute, has to go We're going to you today. Okay. And, I'm and, happy we're, and we're not going to do what we've been doing. Uh, you put a price on our children's head. No. Yes, when you started this liquefaction in our state, you, you put a price. This is not an environmental issue. This is a little human being. I have tried for two years to work with you on this, and I've been ignored. 
Now, I don't mean to put you on the spot here, He's sir, but enough is enough. Spot. Enough is enough. Yeah. We need to get this took care of. Yeah. Your business with these coal companies is your business and your politics. This is not about politics. We're asking people for money all over this country. Today is our official announcement of it. So it's just, it's just in this embryo sure. stages. We're going to raise five to ten million dollars. It's going to happen. We want you to be a partner with us. We want you to support our efforts. We want to help you do a better job. Sure. And I, I appreciate it. I don't mean to be upset and progressive, but if this was your child, would you not be? Well, you know, enough's enough, you know. Yeah, I mean, she's a beautiful little child. I wish and we was. care about our children down there, and there's serious problems. There's a lot of issues, and I, I know you're aware of them. There's intimidation going on there. A lot of intimidation. The teacher that spoke out last year now has been told he better shut when his you, mouth. When you off, what are you going to do from this? I'll do everything order. in my power that I can. What does that mean, Governor? That means that I do everything in my power. Guys, with that, we got to. We gotta. Following his meeting with Ed Wiley, Governor Manchin heads outside to listen to the New River Overture by the Clay County Middle School Band. Across the plaza, Pennies of Promise supporters, including Mountain Justice Summer activists, await him. Journalist Jeff Goodell's book, Big Coal, The Dirty Secret Behind America's Energy Future, explores the history and use of coal in America and throughout the world. Like many Americans, I didn't even realize that we still burn coal. You know, I thought coal was something that went out with top hats and corsets. I thought that electricity was just something that flowed down from a golden bowl in the sky. I never gave any thought to where it came from. The idea that coal produces 50% of the electricity in America never occurred to me. So I went down to West Virginia and I didn't know what to expect. I remember my first view, I was driving outside of Charleston and I saw the boom on one of the big drag lines swinging above the hills and I pulled off the road and I hiked up through the woods to the top of this hill and I got this view down into this strip mine and it was just like hell had opened up before me. The money and the, and coal mining has always gone to the top and been siphoned out by the, the owners, essentially, whether they're corporations or coal barons like Don Blankenship. It's a commodity business. Every penny that they have to spend for safety, for wages, for health care, or anything like that is money that they see coming directly out of their pocket. And, you know, the, the, the history of coal mining is very clear on this. There's no, it's, it's not a subtle thing. You know, this is an industry that views workers as uh, disposable and views the landscape as disposable. And it's all about getting the coal out of the ground as quickly and as cheaply as possible. All the tools and everything you needed to mine and load this coal with, you bought them yourself back then. And if you were starting out in the mines, you had to have those tools. They'd let you get them on credit at the company store <laughs> for about three prices. <laughs> Put it this way, a lot of your coal camps had company stores. They hired you, you lived in their coal camp, you worked for them, they didn't want to catch you in somebody else's store. <laughs> really? Wow. And when a lot of those old miners died, they still owed the company store. You couldn't catch up with them and pay them off. <laughs> They even had company money called Scrip. The only place it was any good was a company store. I, I got my dad's Scrip. It's worth more today than it was back then. <laughs> All right. You's young and healthy, though, you could make more than $2 a day. Right here's how they kept track how much you'd make. See this metal tag? It's called a check tag. Give you a handful of these, stamp your number on it. Once you got your car loaded with coal, somewhere on this car you'd hang one of your check tags. I'd be a mule driver. A lot of times I'd be a young boy back then. Didn't want to stay in school. He would pull an empty car in here, drop it off, unhook his mule from it, hook onto the full one, pulled it outside. All right, now it was real easy to load rock in with your coal. I'm gonna show you a light. You got a water tank in this light. 
open that valve, let a little water drip in your carbide. Now you see that right there? Mm -hmm. They say it doesn't smell real good, but it works pretty good. You look at the history in our area especially, they was big communities down there. They were skating rinks, big company stores, everything, lots of people. I mean, it was just the company houses all down that river. Our stuff's getting shut down. Our schools are getting shut down because there's no money. All the stores are, are, are closing down. Nothing's coming back. These are out-of-state people with this coal company, and they're taking and taking and taking and never putting nothing back. And it's all going to be gone. They're going to leave West Virginia broke and gone. It'll be gone and over with. It, 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 it'll be nothing left. Five years ago, a mountaintop removal site moved into the headwaters of the stream that runs by my home. In the past five years, I've been flooded seven times. There's been about five acres of my property. It's washed away into the stream down below where I live. Um, it, my, my property's been completely devastated, devalued. There, there's no way I could sell and relocate. My property's worthless. The mine company had the option of getting in touch with me and letting me know that uh, what was coming at me, and uh, they didn't. They trapped me and my kids at the mouth of a flooding hollow and basically trashed our lives. Now, when someone does that to you, you don't go along with it. You have no choice but to go against it. I go home to it. I live in the middle of this. Why? Because it's okay. It's okay that me, a hillbilly from southern West Virginia, lives in the middle of this hell so everybody else keep her damn lights on. Yeah. Wrong. I don't owe nobody nothing. I don't owe these men jobs. I don't owe them jobs. And if they think I do, I do they're dead wrong. Across Appalachia's coal fields, mining jobs are vital to local economies. My husband has worked with Massey for eight or nine years now. Um, we really appreciate Massey. That's where we get our money. That's, you know, our way of living. But traditional deep mining requires more workers than mountaintop removal. Since 1950, the total number of mining jobs has steadily decreased from approximately 120,000 to less than 20,000 today. Over the same period, coal production has steadily increased. Many coal field residents are also concerned about another byproduct of coal production, slurry ponds. The slurry impoundments, uh, the way that we dispose of the refuse that comes from the cleaning of coal, uh, which is literally nothing but dirt and rock. I mean, that's what you're separating from the coal. So that's what you're disposing of. It's not toxic. It's not. Uh, you know, as people, many people would like you to believe that, that there's something wrong. It's the indigenous dirt and rock that is uh, caught up in the coal seam. And that natural material includes mercury, lead, arsenic, and a whole suite of heavy metals, which as long as they're in that rock, you can drink the water because they'll be underground, they'll be, they will not be exposed to oxygen. They, if you don't disturb them, they will not be uh, brought into solution. And you can literally, some of the best water we have in West Virginia comes right out of a coal seam. But when you disturb that rock, start grinding it up into fine particles, adding a whole bunch of chemical additives to it to get it to separate the coal from the other inorganic materials, then you come up with this witch's brew of material that you wouldn't want any exposure to at all. We, we know almost nothing about it. I've got a database that now has 14 samples worldwide of coal slurry that are in the public domain. Six of these are from the post-Martin County, you know, the, 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 the biggest environmental disaster in the southeastern United States. Six samples representing what that material that entered our rivers and streams really is, which I find rather preposterous. 309 million gallons affecting over 50 miles of a major river system, a spill bigger than the Exxon Valdez, and we took six samples. The occurrence that happened in Kentucky uh, was simply one where you had one built over old uh, underground works and they gave way in the bottom. 
and that's what happened. The structure itself did not give way. In Mingo County, West Virginia, within sight of Massey Energy CEO Don Blankenship's home, Carmelita Brown has been battling for clean About 20, water. 20 some years ago, um, overnight, our water turned black, blackish gray. And I started hollering and screaming, and my husband got up and asked, asked me what was wrong. He came in and he said, when he looked at it, he said, oh my God, he said, that's coast slurry. We went and looked at 15 wells, um, sent the samples off to a laboratory, got the testing results back and did some analysis on those results. And it was pretty compelling that we needed to do more research down there. I'd never seen water quality that poor. That's pretty good compared to what it was this morning. These documents from the West Virginia Department of Natural Resources, researched by Mountain Justice Summer volunteers, are permits for coal slurry injections that took place in the early 1980s at the slurry impoundment located approximately two miles above Carmelita Brown's home. This permit shows that over 208 million gallons of slurry was injected in 1984 and 1985. This permit describes slurry injections in 1984 into an abandoned underground mine at the rate of 600 gallons per minute. The basis for um, injecting coal slurry and other things, other wastes underground is an EPA 1980s uh, study called Underground Injection Control. Well, that's the oxymoron of the century, underground injection control. Now, what control do we have when we inject something underground and have no idea where it goes? These slurry ponds, if, they, if Massey Energy was to pull out tomorrow for some reason, went bankrupt or whatever, all these slurry ponds, you know who's responsible for them? The counties. We got the paperwork. We know the counties are responsible for the cleanup of these slurry ponds. The county don't have that kind of money. Nobody wanted to help us. Nobody want, Nobody was concerned. And it wasn't only me, it was all my neighbors up down this road. Well, the patients that I see from Raw have uh, significant medical problems that other people don't have. A greater uh, number of people with Alzheimer's disease and old timers disease, memory loss. I've seen a great number of people who have numbness and tingling of their arms and legs, which indicates a heavy metal um, accumulation. I, I've seen a fair amount of, of just Ill, Ill health. My next door neighbor's on a kidney dialysis. Another neighbor of mine is on, is, has lost a kidney, had, a, had to have a kidney transplant. I have problems with my kidneys. The, the uh, contaminated water exposes them to many types of metals, cadmium, and, uh, among others, and it causes kidney damage. There are several people up and down this area has lost babies. They've carried them six, seven months and have them, they be stillborn. On the day of this interview, a small creek less than one mile from their home flows black. And that's not normal. That's coming from an abandoned coal mine or that's coming from a slurry pond. I don't know what to expect. And I've got maybe a few more years of my life. Uh, my health has went down tremendously. And I don't ever look to be health-wise, I don't ever look to be the same. And I don't think there's anything anybody can do to help me. But the only thing I want now, I want good water. I want them to quit pumping or quit injecting or whatever they're doing. I want them to quit that. And I want my life to be better. For the last 20 years, it's been hard. You can't make it without good water. Currently, there are over 140 billion gallons of coal slurry contained in more than 100 impoundments in West Virginia alone. The total quantity of coal slurry in the rest of southern Appalachia is unknown. 
On December 22, 2008, a coal ash impoundment at the Tennessee Valley Authority's Kingston Fossil Plant failed when an earthen dike broke, spilling over 1.1 billion gallons of coal ash sludge over 300 acres. Coal ash sludge is waste created from the burning of coal at the Kingston Coal Plant and is believed to contain toxic compounds, including arsenic and mercury. The Tennessee Valley Authority estimates the cost of the cleanup at over $825 million. This spill is 10 times larger than the Exxon Valdez spill in Alaska and is believed to be America's largest environmental disaster to date. We're throwing away the next generation's most valuable resource, and that is water, one of the best sources of water anywhere in the world, and maybe the best source of fresh water in proximity to one of the world's largest, fastest growing populations. You know, with all the hubbub and all the lawsuits and all the carrying on that goes on in the, in the press and, uh, you know, the vanity fairs and, uh, and the U.S. News and World Reports and all that, that where the authors are wanting people to believe that, that we're absolutely uh, stripping Appalachia down to nothing uh, uh, in order to get the mineral uh, is patently untrue. It's patently untrue when you look around at the forested mountains that we have. A recent environmental impact statement from the EPA estimates over 800 square miles of mountains have already been destroyed. This includes the permanent destruction of over 450 individual mountain summits across the region. The report also indicates the permanent loss of over 1,200 miles of mountain streams. Although federal regulations for mine reclamation require that mountaintop removal sites be returned to their original contour, these mines are routinely granted waivers. Mined areas are typically graded and then hydro seeded with Lespedeza grass, which clings to the compacted shale and rock that now makes up the topsoil. Nature builds soil for free, but she creates the soil very slowly. And so you're talking about thousands of years to go from something like a rock mass that has uh, essentially no soil or just a very thin covering of, to generate a few centimeters of soil, you're talking about hundreds, two thousands, and tens of thousands of years. Continuing at its present rate, the projected loss from mountaintop removal mining is 1.4 million acres in the next decade, an area equal in size to the state of Delaware. By the summer of 2006, Ed Wiley has formulated a new plan for pennies of promise. Our, our government's not going to do it, our, our local school board and state school board's not going to do it. And we as citizens, you know, and parents and grandparents, it's up to us to, to get this job done for the kids. You know, we're, we're going to raise the money for a school one way or another. However long it takes, we will get a new school built in our community. And uh, it, it's, 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 uh, it's a shame that our government has, has come to this if we can't get nothing done for our children. <laughs> walk from Charleston, West Virginia to Washington, D.C., as you all know. This is to raise awareness and raise money for a new school. And it also opens a lot of doors to the things that's happening in our communities as far as mountaintop removal, what it's doing to us in, 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 in the mining industry to our communities. This is a perfect example of what, what it's actually doing to our children. The governor made a statement, our kids are our future, they are tomorrow. He said they are our most up importance. Our kids at Marsport don't have a moral. Thank everybody. These people are fighting for their lives. This is not an environmental fight for them. This is a all-out war for their lives. Whenever I'm there, I'm struck and I'm moved by the depth of the connection to the place where they live, to their home place, to the forest, to the woods. And it's not some squishy 
green environmental yuppie thing. It's not because uh, they think the trees are spiritual beings per se or something like that in, in the simplest sense of the word. It's because their families have lived there for 10 generations. It's because their grandparents built the houses that they're in. It's because they know every inch of the ground around their home places. Um, they are fighting for their lives. And they're not fighting for some pretty image of the mountains. They're fighting for a way of life. And they're fighting against a big, powerful industrial machine that really doesn't care about them. It's important that we get this school moved and get these children in a good, safe place. There's ways you can get involved and you can't have a free pamphlet on what I'm doing. Try to save little children's lives around the southern coal fields in Appalachian Mountain. Okay, so you're taking donations today? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm a, a principal here on vacation, so well, anything for the children. Well, it's great. Looking over, I'm trying to help little children in the North County. Try to save little children's lives in Appalachian Mountain. The burning of coal is, for over a century has been one of the most deadly things that humans have done to the air around them. Even after a hundred years of burning coal and after a um, hundred years of so-called improvement of, of air quality, according to the American Lung Association, 24,000 people a year still die prematurely from air pollution from coal plants. In the United States, almost 40% of the carbon dioxide emissions come from coal. One of the things that has to happen is that, that the, the politicians, the leaders of the administration as well as Congress, the state legislators and the administrations in the states, all those leaders have got to finally say, hey, we want to mine coal. In the 2000 election, West Virginia was widely credited with giving President Bush the margin he needed to take the Oval Office. It was the first time that West Virginia had gone Republican in something like 70 years. And guess what's going to happen come November? We're going to carry the state of West Virginia. The coal industry was widely credited for giving Bush West Virginia. So it was no secret that he had a, a large debt to pay to the coal industry, and, and they made sure he paid it throughout mine safety, throughout the rollback of uh, regulations on dirty power plants, through a variety of, of places. He essentially stocked all the regulatory agencies with, with former coal industry lobbyists or uh, executives. By 2001, the Bush administration made a slight wording change in the Clean Water Act, designating waste as fill. This wording change cleared the way for the expansion of mountaintop removal mining throughout southern Appalachia. On January 22nd of 2002, President Bush returned to West Virginia. It is such a wonderful day for us and for West Virginia to host a special man with a, with a special bond to our state. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. And we can do a better job in America. One of these days we're going to be driving you know, automobiles that are fueled differently. And that's going to be exciting times for America. In other words, there's new technologies coming down, and we can encourage those technologies. So conservation, technological development have got to be an integral part of energy. But folks, we need more supply. You know, I'm working, walking back here in the back, and they said, I'm now repairing a machine that digs for coal. We need to use coal. We got a lot of it, and we need to make sure that we got coal. For the past 20 years, Larry Gibson and his family have been fighting to preserve their ancestral home place on Cayford Mountain outside Charleston, West Virginia. When I met with the coal company to fight over my property here, me and my family members, and they told me that we don't give a damn about people in Cabin Creek Colony, we don't give a damn about the people on top of that mountain, all we care about is the profit we were making, and it was the, dollar, it was the bottom and the top line. No in-between there, and this is 
Vice President of Cofield Productions, Eugene Kitts from Massey Cole, 1993, told me this. Gibson created the Stanley Ayers Foundation, refusing to sell his family's 50-plus acres to coal companies. Before mountaintop removal began, his family cemetery was surrounded by mountain ridges. Today, the family cemetery looks out on reclaimed mountaintop removal sites. 18 years ago when I came back, and it took me four years to clear my family cemetery, and then from 1990 to now, to clear the rest of the land. 18 years ago when I started this, I couldn't get two people to listen, not even my own family. Now, now, have I turned the corner? I've crested a knob on the hill that was there once before that's no longer there in my own mind. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And there's a hope. There was always hope, because that's all I had. The heart of the heart. Mr. The young eyes of the day will never see what I've seen. The young eyes of the day will never see the mountains that, with no limits, no boundaries where you could roam. Gibson uses the land at Cayford Mountain to educate the public about the effects of mountaintop removal. One of the biggest questions people ask me if I had a picture of the mountain before it was destroyed. You people know. Why should you take a picture of the damn mountain for? It's going to be here forever. Day by day, the 7,500 acres of active mountaintop removal mine continue to encircle yeah, his property. Oak, yeah. Another family cemetery sits across the ridge on the active mine site. Although regulations require that family members have access to these cemeteries, requests are often not easily granted. On Memorial Day of 2006, Gibson and a group of supporters make a trip to the cemetery. Well, today uh, we're going to go on to the mine site of the cemetery uh, over there, and we got the high walls around it and different things going on. And uh, uh, it's just to me, it's, it's the uh, whole idea of uh, showing the public how far they'll go to, to get the coal, even into a graveyard. After filling out identification and release forms, the group is permitted to enter the mine site to begin a one and a half mile hike to the family cemetery. I just can't imagine Larry having to sign a release to go visit my family cemetery. My, my heart is with you always. The first water hole I ever swam in in my life was up that hall. The water hole's not there no more. We got a seven, six, seven hundred foot high wall there now. My mama gave me birth. These mountains give me life. Well, you can get to the cemetery through there and come over here on the edge and go around. There used to be a road over here. Yep. So right here, here's one. Right here. Uh, over here's another one. Here's one right here. Two people are taking part in the history. This land, the cemetery has been here for 270 years. Never had this many people on it in the last 150 years. The last time I tried to come through here, they weren't so gentle and so kind. And since we got a minister here, I won't tell you what else they said to me. And these people laying beneath these graves. The first time me and Julian come here four years ago, we had headstones that had dates on them. They're no longer here. It's even been said that we came and got them. <laughs> That's not the case. And the words that Mr. Allen's going to say, Allen Johnson's going to say, is words that's not been heard here for a long, long, long time. Let us uh, pray. <clears throat> oh, Creator God, you made this extraordinary, wonderful, marvelous place here on this earth. God, give us a vision and a fortitude and a strength and a courage of conviction to turn back this evil time and be healers of this land, restorers of the promise you had when you made this place. In the name of the resurrected Jesus, amen. 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 Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures.
In mid-August of 2006, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection revoked a permit to Massey Energy to expand its plant at Marsh Fork Elementary by building a second coal silo. The DEP determined that the second coal silo was placed outside the permitted boundary of 300 feet from the school after maps of the preparation plant were found to be inaccurate. Nobody would stand up. Nobody would stand up to these people. I stand up for my granddaughter's life. I stand up for 240 kids' little life. I represent them children at Marsh Fork Elementary, and I will stand, and I will fight, and, and, and I will do whatever it takes to get something done for these children. The, the issue's not hidden no more. It's out, and we're going to get it out there. And this side was very far. Well, no, it wouldn't. Uh, I couldn't have talked to as many folks as I have along the way. Uh, there's been a lot of folks show support. We've educated a lot of folks on the issue. We've raised a little money for the new school on the issue, and one of our goals was just to come here and hopefully talk and meet with Senator Byrd. And I feel that we accomplished all three of them, and uh, I believe it's going to open a lot of doors for a lot of people uh, on this issue. Uh, no, it's very important for me to walk. On March 14, 2007, the State Board of Surface Mining overturned the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection's ruling that denied Massey Energy a permit to build a second coal silo behind the school. This decision cleared the way for the expansion of Massey Energy's coal processing facility. Two days later, a coalition of citizen conservation groups, including Mountain Justice Summer activists, returned to West Virginia Governor Joe Manchin's office. of those children that as it's raining outside right now are setting at the toe of a sludge dam, sir. Yes. Does that mean anything to you? We preached for y'all for three years, and if something happens today, the people in this capital is to be held accountable for. Absolutely. What I want to ask you to do, I'm going to go back to the back corner. We need to clear this way because people have got to get back and forth to work. I commit this. A new school at Mark Fork will clear this work through. You got the paper, the paper going to get a new school, that's the only way you're going to cure anything here. I'm telling you, we are not budging, there's more coming. Go get Joe! Go get Joe! Our kid means more to me than a whisper in the ear quiet this thing down. We want results today. We want our kids in a safe new school. 
Simple as that. Why is our kids any different? Because they're in the coal field. They're on the wrong side of the mountain. We are the people that bring that money out of that mountain. Absolutely. It's our money. And we need to be took care of. This is our building. Our children are going to be taken care of. You Before the state can get involved in issues such as whether a school should be moved or if a new school should be built, a decision must first be made at the local level. I am encouraging the local school board to put the decision on a new school at Marsh Fork before a vote of the people of Raleigh County so they can determine the final outcome for themselves. Signed, Governor Joe Manchin. Now, if I could, I'd call Captain McCarthy and uh, Director Smithers to the, uh, to the podium. Hey, peace. Issues, if we can't get those issues addressed, then make no mistake, if we have to make take people into custody, we are certainly prepared to do that. All of our staff are on our staff. Let's get the cameras over here. Cameras. What do you want? What do you want for a new school in Marshport Community?
Funding for this program provided in part by the Finger Lakes Grassroots Festival of Music and Dance, supporting arts education and the fight against AIDS. Program support also provided by the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, a grassroots organization dedicated to the improvement and preservation of the environment. Support also provided by the first annual Mountain Aid Benefit Concert, supporting clean energy for North Carolina and beyond. And by the Green Building, Louisville, Kentucky. DVD copies of this program, including special features and scenes not seen in the broadcast, are available from HawRiverFilms.com.